mothers today, the title is A Kingdom Woman Isn't Isolated. A kingdom woman isn't isolated. Now, we are going to go through, um, as much as time will allow, women in the New Testament. Now, if you've already read your daily Bible reading today, um, the chapter in Judges gives us a picture of Deborah. And then also, Jael, like, she's a hoss. Okay, she takes a tent post, derives it in the temple. Like, the guy is sleeping. Like, if you saw this in Hollywood, you would be like, what is wrong? And this is in the Bible, okay? She takes the tent post, the man is sleeping, she derives it in the temple of his head with a hammer. Now, how strong do you have to be? And how coordinated do you have to be to hit the tent post and not your hand? I'm just saying, I'm not that coordinated. And it's like he's sleeping so you can't wake him up. You know what I mean? So Deborah is like literally like, okay, guy, you can do it. And he's like, no, I'm not doing it without you. And she's like, okay, I'll go with you. And then they get there. And even still, he's like, are you sure? And she's like, you can do it. Right? So two incredible. When I read this this morning, I was like, oh my gosh, how much more perfect could it possibly be to see these two? And this is not like a woman's lib thing. Like all the guys don't need to vacate. Like we're not doing any of that, but we're just saying like, obviously, even just like looking at Eve, like women carry a lot of weight in, in the family and in the order of God. And if you don't steward that correctly, it can have very detrimental ramifications. And so we want to not hear through ears of, of condemnation, because as I was going over these notes, I'm like, oh, this may not be very encouraging, but um, love is correction. And so, um, you know, have a gift in the lobby, have a great time with your family. But right now, like we just have to realize like this is, this is the measuring stick. And if I'm not measuring up, then I need to change. And I want to position myself, not specifically just for mothers, but for women. And so let's start with um, Proverbs 18.1. Obviously, we've been looking at the enemy of isolation as it pertains to our um, productivity in faith. And Proverbs 18.1 says, one who separates or isolates himself seeks his own desire. Isolation is selfish. It's selfish. Um, seeks his own desire, and he quarrels against all sound wisdom. So isolation is selfish, but it's also foolish. It's completely foolish. So you cannot produce in isolation. Specifically, the role of women, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Now the Lord God said, it's not good, sufficient, or satisfactory that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper. So as it pertains to kingdom purposes, notice that we're not just called to help as it pertains to the marriage relationship, but there's a mantle on our life to help get the job done. And ultimately, you're either going to be preoccupied with your own job or you're going to be occupied with the kingdom job. And you have to decide. And guys, if you're single, you need to realize um, and evaluate, uh, you know, who you're interested in, um, Sometimes you just have thoughts. You don't. You, you don't. You don't. You don't say them. It's good. <laughs> it is good. It's good that it's not said. It's good that it's not said. Um, you need to evaluate what they're building or what they're helping. You know what I'm saying? And who they were helping just six months ago before they got with you in bed. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so we said it as nicely as we could. Second Timothy chapter three. just like, listen, this is Christians. This is for Christians or those that want to be Christian. Second Timothy chapter three. This is what we're up against. Verse one, don't be naive. There are difficult times ahead. As the end approaches, people are going to be self-absorbed, money hungry, self-promoting, stuck up, profane, contemptuous of parents, crude, coarse, dog eat dog, unbending, slanderers, impulsively wild, savage, cynical, treacherous, ruthless, bloated windbags, addicted to lust, and allergic to God. They'll make a show of religion, but behind the scenes, they 
their animals. Stay clear of these people. These are the kind of people who smooth talk themselves into the homes of unstable and needy women. So in the last days, there are going to be unstable and needy women, and what happens? They get picked off. Look what happens. They're taken advantage of. They're depressed by their sinfulness. Therefore, they take up. What, what does it mean to be depressed by, this, by their sinfulness? They're in shame. So they take up with every new religious fad that calls itself truth. They're not stable. They don't stay planted. They're constantly like in insecurity, like bouncing around. Every new day, there's every, with every new day, there's a new thing that God's called them to do. It's like, well, what about what he told you to do yesterday? They take up with every new religious fad that calls itself truth. They get exploited every time. And listen to this, they never really learn. They never really learn. They're, they're walking around the same mountain they were walking around five years ago, three years ago. No progress, right? And so when we look at these New Testament women, because in many cases, especially when we read the book of Acts and the letters, we can quickly overlook these names that are referenced. But if your name is in that word, that means something. There's nothing in here that was unintentionally added. So start in Luke 8, and you guys don't have to turn there because there's, there's a lot. Just make note and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you and to really see um, women in, because again, there's such, look at what Eve did. Yeah. Eve's isolated from her husband, yeah. or at least he's not paying attention. We don't know. She's isolated from the truth, yeah. right? And that takes the whole system in a turn of events for the very worst. Right. And it's still happening today, Right? When I think about over the last, you know, the years that I can recall of this ministry, a lot of the problems that we've had, not all the problems, but a lot of the problems that we've had in ministry and in church were driven by women, by women. Yeah. Now, she might have got her man riled up, but for the most part, most of those problems, the woman was in the driver's seat. Again, she might have got her man involved, but not near as many of them was the man leading the charge. She was leading the charge. Okay? So you, you got you, you, This is the thing. Luke 8, 1. He continued according to the plan. Jesus traveled to town after town, village after village, preaching God's kingdom, spreading the message. The 12 were with him, and there were also women in their company. So the 12 were with him, but there were also women in their company who had been healed of various evil afflictions and illnesses. See, this is the problem. When you're delivered, you don't draw a line in the sand and keep moving in that deliverance. Right. And you're vulnerable. Right. You're vulnerable, yeah. right? Because there's places you've been that other people haven't been that make you vulnerable. And the enemy is so lazy, he thinks, if I've hooked her in that drug addiction once, I can get her again. Yeah. If I can get her insecure, if I can get her sleeping with multiple people in one season of her life, I can get her there again, yeah. right? Whereas somebody who's never touched that stuff, somebody who's never been down that road, they, they, they don't know how to get to that road. Right. They have no idea how to get to that road. So you have to be very, very intentional. When they were delivered, they dropped everything, just like the disciples had the opportunity at the start of his ministry, but they dropped everything and they stayed with him. They left their homes, they left their friends, and they followed him because they knew this is like, just like Peter said in John chapter six, when Jesus turned to his disciples when a bunch of them left and said, are you guys leaving too? And they were like, you have the words of life. Like these women knew, okay, this is where it's at. This is where it's at. And this is where we're staying. Mary, the one called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's manager. And Susanna, along with many others, listen to this, who used their considerable means to provide for the company. So these are wealthy women who are financially connected. So a kingdom woman is financially connected connected. A kingdom woman is financially connected. So you look at, you look at how you're spending your money. The reality is every home has money for what the wife says they have money for, for the most part. 
And that doesn't mean you have it in the bank, but whether you charge it or whatever, that's biblical. Proverbs 31 calls you or, or basically has anointed you the CEO of the home. That's just the bottom line. And so when your priorities aren't right, or when you're positioning yourself in your desires, your appetites for houses, for cars, for things at the expense of the kingdom, then you put extra pressure on the entire household. You can't give, you can't, so you don't have, you don't have any seed in the ground because the seed's on your face. Right? right. Yeah. Nothing wrong with any seed on your face. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying not his seed. Okay, and I'm talking about makeup. You know, it's early. Just make sure everyone knows. <laughs> Luke 24. At the crack of dawn on Sunday, the women came to the tomb carrying the burial spices they had prepared. So because Jesus was crucified on a Friday and they took the Sabbath seri seriously, they didn't come on Saturday because that was their Sabbath. They took it seriously, but they got up and did it on Sunday. Now we know, and you can read like the whole, the whole account, but obviously, well, let me just read it. There's not very many verses here. At the crack of dawn on Sunday, the women came to the tomb carrying the burial spices they had prepared. They found the entrance of the stone, the stone rolled back from the tomb. They walked in, but once inside, they couldn't find the body of the master Jesus. They were puzzled, wondering what to make of this. Then out of nowhere, it seemed two men lie cascading over them stood there. The women were all struck, bowed down and worship. The men said, why are you looking for the living one in the cemetery? He's not here. He's been raised up. Remember how he told you uh, when you were back in Galilee that he had been handed over <clears throat> to sinners, be killed on a cross, and in three days rise up. Then they remember Jesus's word. Verse nine, they left the tomb and broke the news of all this to the 11 and the rest, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them. Right? So this is like a company. Like in many cases, you could almost assume that if there were 12 men, there were potentially almost that many women also. So the other women with um, them kept telling these things to the apostles, but what? The apostles didn't believe a word of it. They thought they were making it all up. Verse 12, but Peter jumped to his feet ran to the tomb and stooped to look in and saw a few grave clothes, that's all. And he walked away puzzled, shaking his head. So this was their custom um, because Jews didn't believe in, um, what's it called? Embalming the body. Like they didn't, so they were, they were stinking. That's why, remember, Martha was so upset that Jesus was going to roll away the tomb from Lazarus, the stone from Lazarus's tomb, like he's going to stink. So, so they, this is their custom to bring the spices. They honor the Sabbath. But then on Sunday, what I want you to see in these women, because all the apostles are hiding out. They don't know what to do. Like they're freaking out. It's like nobody's thinking like, okay, what were the last things that he said? And obviously these women weren't either because if they had believed that he, had, he, he um, was gonna be risen from the dead, there would be no reason to take those spices. But one thing that I want you to see about these women and what's so important about kingdom women is they have this ability to just do what they know to do, like keep the ball rolling. You know, like everyone's sitting around, everyone's hiding out and it's like, okay, well, what are we gonna do? You know what I mean? Think about even like when somebody, when somebody has a baby, when somebody loses a loved one, um, you know, just in crises of life, sometimes, um, well, and I can't speak for, for you as much as in my household, I've seen there be such a strength, just like we see in judges today, that a woman can stand up in the household and say, okay, this is what we need to do. This is our next step. Not that a man is like freaking out or doesn't know what to do, but, but if we are called to help, and if you, if you don't do that, I, I, want, I want you to see yourself, but I also want you to address areas in your life where you've allowed religion or complacency or carnality to keep you from being in your place. Because when all things go crazy, you should be able to like rise up and there should be a strength in you to just like do the next right thing. Well, this is what we do. This is what we've always done. So we're just gonna get up and in faith, we're just gonna do what we've always done. And they are blessed because they're actually the first ones to receive the news that he has been resurrected. But they had to get up and do something. I mean, they could have stayed hiding out with all the other apostles because they were just as known for following him as they were. 
but they just got up and said, okay, well, what do we know to do? This is what we always do. And so we're just going to keep things moving forward. See, like kingdom women are like movers. Do you know what I mean? Like they're, they know how to do stuff. I guess is, is what we're trying to say. So let's move into um, Jesus's ascension, get into the book of Acts. Acts 1, 12 through 14. They left the mountain called Olives. They returned to Jerusalem. It was a little over a half a mile. They went to the upper room they had been using as a meeting place. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James. See, the fact that their name is mentioned is significant. Simon the Zealot, Judas the son of James, they agreed they were in this for good. They agreed in that moment. Okay, he left, this is what he told us to do. We're gonna do what he said to do. They all like basically signed up all over again. They recommitted themselves and they completely together in prayer, the women included also, and also Jesus' mother Mary and his brother. So kingdom women are committed. I wrote this way. They're faithful in their prayers. You know, so many people, so many women aren't in it for good. They're not. They're in it today and until something doesn't go their way. And then it's all some weird, you know, the Lord's having us move on. Okay. Acts 9, 36 through 43. Down the road, away to Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. She was well known for doing good and helping out. During the time Peter was in the area, she became sick and died. You have to evaluate. Like, if I died, would anyone care? Like, being honest. Being honest. Her friends prepared her body for burial and put her in a cool room. Some of the disciples had heard that Peter was visiting in nearby Lydia and sent two men to ask if he would be so kind as to come over. Peter got right up and went with them. They took him into the room where Tabitha's body was laid out. Her old friends, most of them widows, were in the room mourning. They showed Peter pieces of clothing um, that she had made while she was with them. Peter put the widows all out of the room and he knelt and prayed. He spoke directly to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up, he took her hand and helped her up. Then he called in the believers and the widows and presented her to them alive. She had more to offer here than there, and they put a demand on her kingdom qualifications. So much so that they called her back to life, right? Why? What was she known for doing? Helping out. And there was a paper trail of all that she contributed in the form of textiles. Like if she's gone, this is going to be missed. This is a kingdom enterprise that is very valuable. And the value with which she took her gift, like the seriousness with which she was resolved to help, enabled supernatural forces to get involved so that she could see the completion of her destiny, right? And other people around her were not content to be without her because she what? She helped. Like you have to look at your life very honestly and, and, and evaluate, like, how does my life impact the bottom line? And not just financially, but like the flow. Because kingdom women help. And if you're not helping, you're not in your anointing. Because that's what you were made to do. And you want to ask the Holy Spirit, I can't, I don't know for you. I don't have four reasons why women don't help today. I don't have that. That wasn't in my heart. What was in my heart was just to make sure that you had been introduced to these women. You're going to have to do that on your own and figure out why you don't help and let him show you. Acts 12, um, verses 6 through 19. And honestly, we probably won't, we'll, we'll skip around because we won't have time to read this whole When King Herod got it into his head to go after some of the church members, he murdered James, John's brother. And when he saw how much it raised his popularity rating with the Jews, gosh, man, the haters, religious, religious devils are like the most, they're the ugliest devils. I hate religious spirits. He arrested Peter, all this during Passover week, mind you, and he had him thrown in jail, putting four squads of four soldiers each to guard him. He was 
planning a public lynching after Passover. All that time, Peter was under heavy guard in the jailhouse. The church prayed for him most strenuously. Then the time came for Herod to bring him out for the kill. That night, even though shackled to two soldiers, one on either side, Peter slept like a baby, which is a message in and of itself. And there were guards at the door keeping their eyes on the place. Herod was taking no chances. Verse seven, suddenly there was an angel at his side, a light flooding the room. The angel shook Peter and got him up. Hurry, the handcuffs fell off his wrist. The angel said, get dressed, put on your shoes. Peter did it. Then grab your coat and let's get out of here. Peter followed him, but didn't believe it was really an angel. Like he's a heavy sleeper, obviously, right? He thought he was dreaming. Verse 10, past the first guard and then the second, they came to the iron gate that led into the city. It swung open before them on its own and they were out on the street free as the breeze. At the first intersection, the angel left him going his own way. That's when Peter realized, okay, this is no dream. I can't believe it. This really happened. The master sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's vicious little production and the spectacle the Jewish mob was looking forward to. Still shaking his head, he went to Mary's house. The Mary, who was John Mark's brother, he went to Mary's house. Now, this is like a real thing. This actually happened, okay? Peter is arrested. You've got religious haters everywhere. Like I'm putting myself in these shoes and I'm saying, I'm arrested by religious haters. Who's gonna even want me in their house? Because in most of my experience, people that were close to me sided with the religious haters or whoever said whatever was said on Facebook and started calling me into question. So I'm low key thinking, okay, in my congregation, if this is me, who's Mary? Whose house am I going to? I'm like, I'm just woke up out of sleep and miracle angel out of prison and I'm disoriented. Where's my safe place? Whose house am I gonna feel like when I open, when I knock on the door, they're not gonna look at me through the eyes of those religious people. Oh, she's been behind bars. We're not so sure about that. Mm. Whose house am I gonna go to? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like this is a kingdom woman. The house was packed with praying friends. So not only is she just hospitable, but she's organizing the prayer meeting. Like we're not gonna let Peter go down like that. So So everyone's coming to my house. You mean like it's one thing to bring people over to eat. Anybody can do that. Do you mean, they're not just coming over there to eat. You know, anybody's welcome at my house. Your house is crazy. You got weird stuff on TV. Your kids are listening to weird music. Just because it's open doesn't mean I want to be there. There's no order or we're just going to eat. Guys, listen, anybody can cook. You know what I'm saying? You just focus on the wrong things. And you pride yourself in things that are of no importance yeah. whatsoever yeah. for eternity. How many people wouldn't want anybody in their house just because they don't feel like their house is good enough? Mm-hmm. It's not big enough. It's not in the right neighborhood. Like any of that matters. Yeah. I don't have a nice enough couch. I don't have this furniture. And then you're just depressed about it because your house isn't nice enough or something. It's just weird. It's just, it's, 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 it's that vulnerable, unstable, needy kind of thing. Or you expend yourself financially beyond what you can actually afford for a presentation that no one's viewing. Yeah, so good. You wanted that house so bad, no one's even coming over there. Yeah. She had organized a prayer meeting. I'm talking about women that make a kingdom impact. Yeah. And you have to be honest with yourself. Yeah. And you have to filter every decision, everything that you buy, every relationship that you entertain, you have to filter everything through this. So she has everyone over, she's having the prayer meeting. When he knocked on the door to the courtyard, a young woman named Rhoda, which when I read about Rhoda, I think about, honestly, I think about Pastor Faith. Um, But she came to see who it was, but when she recognized his voice, Peter's voice, she was so excited and eager to tell everyone Peter was there that she forgot to open the door (laughs) and left him standing in the street. Like Rhoda is obviously Mary's assistant. Okay, so Mary is a woman of means as well. 
But do you just see like a personality? Because like some women, it's like, I don't want to be around you. Not me personally. You know what I mean? Because you can't say that. Like if you're the pastor's daughter, you actually say that out loud. It's like a bad thing. Um, But you know what I mean? Like you don't want to be around them. There's no joy. There's no fun. They're always just serious. You know, just like so serious. And I know what that's like to be serious. I absolutely know what that's like. But you just see a personality in this woman. You see a, a, a fun, a faithfulness, a joy about her, you know? Now she needs to open the door. <laughs> We're not saying anything against that. But, but religion has made the, the kingdom model of women as this haggard, oppressed thing. Yeah. And it shouldn't be like that. Yes, you should be helping, but there should not in this place where, you know, you just look wrung out. And if you look wrung out in your assignment, then you need to get your nails done. (laughs) You know, you need to take a few minutes. You know, you need to get a pedicure, do something. Relax, go to the trees, whatever is your thing, you know, I don't, I don't know. Whatever it is. So they wouldn't believe Rhoda, obviously. Dismissing her, dismissing her report, you're crazy. She stuck by her story, insisting they still wouldn't believe her. So like she's convincing them all this time, and this is the message, it says poor Peter. We know he wasn't poor, but all this time Peter is standing outside, still knocking at the door. So if you're the little kind of, you know, Finally, they opened up and saw him and went wild. Peter put his hands up and calmed them down. He described how the master had gotten out of jail and then said, tell James and the brothers what happened. He left them, but he was off to another place. But again, he had a place to go. He had a place to go. So think about that. Um, This last woman, and we won't read her whole story today, but this last one that we'll be able to get to is um, Lydia. So there's still several more um, that maybe we'll touch on just for a few moments next week. Actually, I might be able to just give you their facts. Acts 16, 11 through 40. I'm not gonna read the whole story, but this is the account of Lydia, a dealer in expensive textiles known to be a God-fearing woman. When Paul and Silas were released from prison supernaturally, and this is Acts 16, 11 through 40. Again, they went straight to Lydia's house. Now, this is very controversial. They're behind bars. Are you, are you the person that, I mean, would it be your house? Yeah. Or are you sitting there in church filtering everything your pastors are saying and doing through everything that a bunch of people who aren't in the family anymore are saying? That's good. That's so Lydia was a Gentile but she was wealthy, she was prominent in her home and, consider, and considerable resource, and she, excuse me, she was a Gentile, she was wealthy, prominent. Her home and considerable resources, hear this, were at the disposal of Paul and his ministry team. Her home and her resources. None of this, well, this is our date night, so I can't be involved. Okay. You can move it. It's flexible. Acts 17, 16 through 34. This woman Demarius D A M A R I S. Very wealthy as well. Like Lydia, wealthy, prominent. Just if you study that and you make note of it, you realize, okay, the gospel wasn't just for poor and undone. So Demarius is a wealthy, prominent woman. Same thing. Her her finances, um, she would have been educated, would have been at the disposal of the disciples. um, But then she also would be able to take the message to a completely different demographic. And you have to think about that. 
like the responsibility, whatever your demographic is, that you are taking it and you are influencing others with it. You're not just coming to church and absorbing it for yourself because these women were a big part of how the gospel moved out of the Jewish circles and into the Gentile circles because God has an anointing on women, not just to help, but to influence. But if you don't take that role seriously, right? And so she would have been able to carry the message to a different audience. And then lastly, Priscilla and Aquila, Acts 18, one through 28. And we hear about them a lot in Paul's ministry, Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila owned a small business, so they were small business owners. They had a tent making business. She specifically was from a wealthy family. They were always mentioned together, which you don't see that a lot in the Bible. Like a lot, you don't know the names of any of the disciples' wives. Do you know? Like, like they don't even get honorable mention. They don't even get honorable mention. But they were always mentioned together, denoting equal partners in life and her a higher profile status because she was always mentioned first. She was always mentioned first, which means in the church, she had a more high profile position because you ne- it's, never, it's never recorded in the word Aquila and Priscilla. It's always Priscilla and Aquila. And for that For the Jews, that meant something, even just the order of their name. But do this in your own life. How do you call certain couples? In your head, don't do it out loud. And don't tell them. Don't tell them. Because ultimately, they're together. That's fine. But I'm just talking to you about your kingdom assignment. Because at the end of your life, that's what you're going to be held accountable for. So as a woman, you you just got to think about it. But think about how you call certain couples. So and so and so and so. So and so and so and so. And sometimes you call the woman first. Why do you do that? And I bet if we talked about it, we would be calling certain ones first. Both of us would, we would all be doing that. (coughs) Do you know what I mean? And in different seasons, it may be different. Because if you're a no show and you're not really helping, because that's, that's why you're here. Women help, yeah. women help yeah. in whatever, like, and literally I can look at my life, I can look at my day and say, this is, this is helping. And this is what it's helping. And this is who it's helping. And this is gonna last for eternity. Yeah. It really sounds very simple, but if we would live like that, how much unnecessary worry, care, how many unnecessary things in our schedule would be eliminated if we would streamline to that kind of kingdom focus and we wouldn't allow ourselves to be bothered by anything outside of that. When you came in today and I gave this to you just because guys, you wouldn't feel left out even though it's not your day, but, um, so this is just the confession girls that I use that I've always used as a non isolated kingdom woman. So this is Proverbs 31, but just in, So like multiple translations combined to make the most sense, okay? Because you can't turn Proverbs 31 into a confession that talks about sewing your own clothes, okay? Because no one's doing that. And if you are, that's fine, but there's a way to word it in different translations that is actually modern day. And so that's what this is, okay? And so this will help you, but I just want to encourage you in your value, not just in your home, but in the local church, that if literally, like if all the women were just doing their part, right. you know, because honestly, guys, guys aren't good with stress. They're not good with problems. They're just not. They're not designed for that. And you got to really ask yourself, like, am I helping? You know, am I, am I just there? Do you mean? Because that's like weight, however much you weigh, you know, or, you know what I'm saying? And, and I get it. Not everyone had the privilege of being raised by Pastor Kathy. And there's no, like, you're not just going to be an idiot. Like, you have to be good at stuff. You, know? right, <laughs> you have right. to know how to do stuff. Not, not everybody's had that advantage, Right. But if women were in their place, I'm just thinking about, you know, in the church, you know, and guys not being all, what do you want them to do? 
You know, men that get upset because you're involved in church, what do you want them involved in? Right. Do you want them wrap, wrapped around a pole? What do you want them to do? Right. What do you want them to do? Right. You know, are, you don't look underfed, bro. Yeah. <laughs> you do not. <laughs> this is the kingdom. We're to look like the kingdom. And the only way we look like the kingdom is when we use the word as the blueprint, not our own ideas, not religion, not what our mom did, but what the word says. Father, thank you for helping us.